Good morning. Welcome to Deborah Heights Wesleyan Church. We're glad to have you here today, whether you're here online or here in person. We're going to begin today with some worship.
you may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Deborah Heights Wesleyan Church. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Jeremy. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us today for worship on this bright, sunny June day. Wow. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on today. Not only is it the first Sunday in June, which promises to be warmer than May was, amen, and a little more sunny than May was, amen, amen, it's also the first day of our church year. So all of the past year is now behind us, and I I am reminded of Paul's words to the Philippians where he said that forgetting what is behind, I press on toward the the future, so whatever went wrong this last year, whatever went right this last year, today is a new beginning for us. And some of us maybe need that today, am I right? It's a good thing to have a new beginning. It's also, this is the Sunday that we in the church world celebrate Pentecost. If you're not familiar with that term, Pentecost is a feast dating back to the, the, uh, they're saying my hair's messed up. My, my hair is at that point where I just forget. Anybody else have that? You just, yeah, whatever. <laughs> right? Permanent bedhead is just the way it is. <laughs> That's it, exactly. So as I was saying, Pentecost, if you're not familiar with the term, dates back to way before Christians ever came about. It was a feast among the ancient Jews to celebrate the harvest season that they had just completed. And along with that, they had a number of things that went on. But one of the big things that they would do is they would light these massive torches and they would light up the sky with what they called the Shekinah glory of God. That's, that's what it was supposed to represent, the glory of God in this place. And as, as the Jews went on, they kind of became more of a routine and things like that. But when the Christians came on the scene, you might remember the first Pentecost of the church, which is where they got together and they were praying for 10 days before and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit rushed upon them. And no longer did they need the Shekinah glory and the lamps standing over the the, uh, temple, but they had the Shekinah glory reigning within themselves in the the form of the Holy Spirit. And, And since that day, we as Christians have enjoyed the presence of the Holy Spirit with us every single day, empowering us, men, women, white, black, red, yellow, blue, English speaking, Swahili speaking, whatever language you can put in there, the Holy Spirit comes upon us and enables us to do amazing things. If you have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to open with me to the book of Acts chapter 2 as we read how this played out starting in verse 1. It said, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven. I imagine this violent rushing wind was the sound similar to a tornado or a hurricane, maybe a fighter jet passing low overhead. It filled the whole house where they were staying, and I imagine that really means everything was shaking. I want you to feel that with me for just a moment, would you? The whole house was shivering, and everything in it, At the sound of this mighty rushing wind. And they saw what looked like tongues of flame separated and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And in the coming verses they would rush out into the street and begin to witness boldly about the Jesus that they had seen. The Jesus that they knew was no longer in the tomb. It was a crazy thing, but by the end of that day, 3,000 people believed in Jesus, the guy who came back from the dead. 3,000 people were baptized. And it's sometimes easy for us to look at this and think, okay, well, the Holy Spirit came and magically these people appeared, but I want us to notice again that last little bit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit 
They began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And they were the ones who rushed out into the street as the Spirit empowered them. Friends, the Holy Spirit doesn't show up to do our job for us. It shows up to enable us to do God's work in this world. So today as we gather in this place, our prayer is, Holy Spirit, come upon us so that we can go out into this world and do your work. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we come to you today desperate for your Holy Spirit. We look to you now and we ask again, send him upon us in power. Bathe us in his presence. Shower us in his power so that when we leave here today, not just will we be different than when we came, but Lord, we will be empowered to go out into our workplaces and our neighborhoods, our homes and our streets to spread the good news of Jesus, that as crazy as it is, a dead man came back to life, people will see and believe because they've seen you working in and through us. Send your Holy Spirit today, we pray. Amen. We'd love to connect with you today. Let's start with that, shall we? If you're here in person or online, we want to connect with you. There are a couple of ways that we can do that. Uh, you can find our online connect card, uh, dhw.church slash connect. It takes about a minute to fill it out on your mobile device or computer at home. And you can uh, tell us what God's been up to in your life this last week and how we can be praying for you in the week to come. We'd love to connect with you that way. Also, if you're online with us this morning, there is an online chat. It's directly below the window that you're, or the video that you're watching right now. Uh, you can click in there and you can introduce yourself, ask any questions you might have. Uh, Pastor Sharon is traveling today. She is on the road and apparently we have found the limitation of what she can do. She cannot drive and chat at the same time. I think we're all thankful for that, but uh, her husband Keith is in there, and I know a couple of others as well, and they would love to talk with you if you're in our chat room today and connect with you that way. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, who has helped out this last week. We did an uh, impromptu teacher appreciation barbecue. We've done this before, and you heard about this, but this last week uh, we were asked by the crew down at Samuelson Elementary if we could uh, throw them a, an additional barbecue. And the reason for this was because they were having some uh, turnover issues and some other things going on as the school year came to an end. And they thought it would just be a great pick-me-up for the staff there. And then, of course, the whole thing in Uvalde, Texas happened. And uh, every one of us wanted to express our solidarity and support with the teachers. And so uh, it was no longer a question of if we would do it. It was just a matter of when. And so on Thursday, a couple of us got together. We went down. We threw a bunch of burgers and hot dogs on a grill. We handed them out. And uh, I think the teachers appreciated it. Um, I heard from a lot of them that they very much loved that barbecue. And they very much appreciate the ministry of our church. So I'm excited about that. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who helped make that possible. Whether you brought the grill and did the cooking and, and handed out food and that kind of stuff where you, you gave toward it, whatever it was, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for helping us love on our community and our teachers this week. Um, next Sunday, a week from today, uh, we're going to send a couple of kids off to uh, uh, junior high youth camp. They will be leaving right after the service here, the English service here in the morning. And uh, so I, I just want to point out Charles is the only one in the service this morning that's going to go, right, Charles? Charles is excited about this, and Isaiah is going to go as well, and we're excited to send both of them. But uh, I just want you to be praying this week that Charles and Isaiah would have their hearts prepared, their minds prepared. And uh, so this morning, before we send them off, do you think we could just pray over Charles and Isaiah, even though Isaiah is not here right at the moment? Can we do that? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to reach your hand toward Charles. Charles, there you are, buddy. We're going to reach our hands towards you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do in Charles' life next week. And we, we pray today that you would help him 
to have an open heart and an open mind so that he gets everything. We pray the same thing for Isaiah, that you would move in power in both of their lives next week. And so this week we pray that you would prepare them. Help them to round up the sleeping bags and the clean clothes and the Bibles and the notebooks and all the other things that have to go along with that. But more importantly, Lord, help them to have minds and hearts that are ready to hear from you. We pray these things in your matchless name. Oh, Jesus. Amen. All right. Yeah. We're excited, Charles. I hope you are too, buddy. We're going to send you off. We're going to leave you at the camp for a whole week. You're going to get homesick and you're going to cry for your mommy. <laughs> Joanna's over there like, no, no, he's not. <laughs> uh, we're excited to send you off to camp, Charles. So have a great week this week as you prepare for it, okay? Um, lastly, um, we're going to be sending some senior high kids in two weeks to camp, and uh, so you want to be praying for them as well. And we have uh, one kid that has, that has adventured to go to kids camp, which is in a couple of weeks as well. And so just be praying for all the kids that are going to camp. As we have now entered June, we are into camp season. So it's exciting times, and uh, just be praying that God would be working in all of their lives. Would you? Lastly, but not least, I want to thank everybody who has continued to faithfully support the ministry of the church here in their finances. Um, God continues to provide uh, miraculously for the needs of the church as we minister in the community. And I just want to say thank you. It's because of your giving that we're able to send kids to camp. It's because of your giving that we're able to do teacher barbecues. It's because of your giving that we're able to do a lot of things to minister to this community. And we just appreciate it immensely. If you would like to begin supporting the church financially, if you'd like to continue supporting the church financially, there are three ways you can do that. The first is through the Tithely app. That's T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y. You can download that on your smartphone or other mobile device. Then you can give using credit card, debit card, or bank draft. You can even set up recurring giving so it just automatically comes out and you don't ever have to worry about it again. Second way you can give is through our website, that's dhw.church slash give, dhw.church slash give. You'll have all the same options you would with the app. And finally, you can always give the tried and true method, uh, cash or check is wel welcome always. Uh, you can put that in the basket at the back of the sanctuary if you're here in person, or you can mail it to us at uh, Deborah Heights Wesleyan Church, 4025 Lower Beaver Road, Des Moines, Iowa, 50310. And once again, we will continue to use your faithfulness, your generosity to advance the kingdom of God here in Des Moines and beyond. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I'd invite you to open it with me to the book of Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be camping out here in Matthew chapter 4, focusing on verses 18 through 22. It's a familiar passage that we'll get to in just a moment, but before we get to that, I want to come back for just a second to the Wizard of Oz. You remember the Wizard of Oz? That classic story that we either read or maybe watched the movie. I loved watching the movie as a kid. And it's amazing the amount of detail that they put into it. Like I, I never realized as a kid the, the, the uh, emus or ostriches that were roaming around in the woods on the set. And you ever notice how sometimes that's the way life is? You, you discover little things that you missed along the way. And you learn new things as you go. Well, in the classic story, The Wizard of Oz, the young Dorothy Gale, along with her little dog Toto, are whisked by a twister from the black and white plains of Kansas to the magical land of Oz. And in order to return home again, Dorothy's told she has to visit with the Wizard of Oz at his home in the Emerald City. And the only way to get there is by following the yellow brick road. So, of course, off she went. You remember the song, Follow the Yellow Brick Road? Remember that one? Somebody can probably sing it better than I, but what I remember is as, after she got done with that song, the very next scene, Dorothy was surprised when a scarecrow called to her from the field. Indeed, there were a great number of things along the way that surprised Dorothy as she traveled that yellow brick road. And if you think about it, I guess it's understandable. I mean, who would expect to meet a talking scarecrow? That's not something that happens every day. 
a cowardly lion, a wicked witch, winged flying monkeys. These are kinds of things that don't happen every single day, and yet Dorothy encountered all of them along the yellow brick road in the magical land of Oz. She discovered all of these amazing things. As you may recall, if you've read the book or even seen the movie, the greatest discovery that Dorothy made along the way, though, was the importance of her friends and her family. And indeed, it was that discovery that made all the difference when she eventually returned home and woke up in her bed back in Kansas. It changed everything for her. Last week, we began a series of sermons about how we grow in grace. And what we discovered is that faith is a unique journey for each of us, right? Every last one of us is on our own journey with this. And so there are going to be individualized things that happen that are different for each of us. But even as they are unique journeys, there are a number of common landmarks that we all have to pass along the way. I told you last week that there are four of these landmarks on the pathway of faith. The first one, of course, we talked about last week is connect, where we connect with God and with each other. Then today we're going to be discussing the idea of discovery, Uh, and so that's the second stop where there's the stop of go, and then there's finally disrupt. Now last week we discussed uh, John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42, uh, Jesus' first encounter with the first few disciples, and we talked about the importance of that connection with Christ and with each other. Indeed, it was the disciples' connection with Christ that saved them. It was their connection with each other that enabled them to to live into their new status as disciples and to minister effectively in the world. Today, as we move into our second stop, we pause for just a second to consider the importance of discovery in the process. If you've been around the church for any length of time, you're going to recognize the passage that we're going to do this in. It's, it's Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, and, and here we have Jesus' ministry just beginning to get started. Now, yes, we saw that Jesus already encountered some of the disciples back at the Jordan River when he was down with John the Baptist, but... Here we discover that some time has passed. Indeed, after being baptized by John and and meeting Peter and Andrew and and probably John the Apostle, uh, Jesus ran out into the wilderness. He was led there by the Holy Spirit. And he he spent 40 days fasting and praying in, in the desert. When he returned from there, he withdrew to Galilee where he had grown up. And he went to live in Capernaum, which was on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. While he was at the Sea of Galilee, he went down to the beach looking for his disciples that he knew were fishermen so that he could finally launch his ministry for real. We pick up the story in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, and here's what we discover. As Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, And his brother Andrew, they were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed Jesus. Now, as I said, this is not the first time that Jesus encountered these men, at least not Peter, Andrew, and John. We're not really sure about James, but we're pretty sure that Peter, Andrew, and John were there in John chapter 1 when uh, he, he was visiting John the Baptist. Now, back then, Andrew and John were quick to follow Jesus. You might remember how that went, that John the Baptist says, hey, There's Jesus, he's the Lamb of God, and Andrew and the other unnamed disciple, which we're pretty sure is John, the writer of the gospel, said, okay, we're going to follow him instead of you, John the Baptist. And so they did. And you might also remember that as soon as they did that, Andrew decided he was going to go and get his brother Simon as well. 
So at least three of the four men in our passage today have previously met Jesus and even gone to hang out with him for a day or two. But then all of a sudden, Jesus disappeared into the wilderness for the better part of six weeks. And by the time he returned, these men, well, as people will when they're left by themselves all alone, they kind of try to wonder, now what? What do we do? Where do we go? And since Jesus wasn't there, they returned to their own homes and they did what fishermen do. They went back to their old way of life and they started to fish. Now fortunately, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, he knew right where to find them. These three men, as I said, were fishermen. So Jesus went down and he walked along the Sea of Galilee, the beach, the primary source of fish in the region. And as he was doing that, he was watching for these three men. Among the different Gospels, there seems to be a little bit of a difference about what they were doing when he found them. But the the bottom line is they were doing what fishermen do. Matthew and Mark tell us that Peter and Andrew were casting a net into the sea while James and John were sitting in a boat preparing their nets to cast into the sea. Luke, on the other hand, tells us that all four men were ashore washing and mending nets so that they would be ready to use again. Now, it's important to recognize the differences in these accounts. It's not necessarily a contradiction. Peter and Andrew may have been casting their net into the sea to, to wash it out, and they all could have been sitting in a boat on the beach while they were working together. That, that may have been what was going on. It's, it's really tough to say. What's more important than that detail, though, is that regardless of exactly what they were doing, the point is that these fishermen were doing what fishermen do. To adapt the catchphrase from a popular insurance commercial, if you're a fisherman, you fish. It's what you do, right? So that's exactly what these guys are doing. They're fishing, or at least they're getting ready to go fishing. But when Jesus arrived on the scene and spoke to them for the first time, all of that went out the window. In verse 19, Jesus called them to follow him, and he promised that if they did, he would make them fish for people. Now, right away we recognize this is a clever play on words. The fishermen would become fishers of men. It's maybe even catchy for us. It helps us to remember this particular verse. But fishers of people or fishers of men was also a familiar term to these four men. As Warren Wearsby noted in Wearsby's study Bible, quote, for centuries Greek and Roman philosophers had used this term to describe the work of the person who seeks to catch others by teaching and persuasion, unquote. For these fishermen then, Becoming fishers of men would require some changes, significant changes, in fact. You see, instead of casting nets, they would be casting teachings. Instead of lugging lunkers over the gunwale of the boat, they would be reeling people in with persuasive rhetoric and acts of kindness. And suddenly we begin to see the problem. You see, fishermen are generally not known for their teaching, their persuasive rhetoric, or even their acts of kindness. I mean, yes, they might be kind, and they might be articulate, able to reasonably express themselves, and that sort of a thing, but these were not teachers or persuaders. They were fishermen. In Jesus' calling, then, there was an implicit promise. That is, he was going to transform these net-mending, net-casting, boat-sitting fishermen into teachers and persuaders so that they could fish for people instead of fish. And I tell you today, it's in that truth that we find our first point. Jesus promises transformation. Jesus promises transformation, and I tell you, that's That's important for two very significant reasons. The first is, he will not let us stay where we are. 
If he is going to transform us, then he's not going to allow us to continue doing the same things that we were doing or even being the same people that we were being before we met him. The second reason this is significant is that he's going to have us do new things that we've never done before and be people that we've never been before. So Jesus is going to have to teach us some new things. Well, let's look at both of these really quickly because the truth is they're both significant to the transformation process. Indeed, each of us, if we're going to follow Jesus, is going to have to leave some things behind. Sin, certainly. Those things about us that we know are not quite right, those things that we know are outright wrong, we're going to have to leave those behind if we want to follow Jesus. But so also we might have to leave behind some perfectly good things because they distract us or they keep us from being who He's called us to be and doing what He's called us to do. It's not that there's sin and we could keep going on our entire lives and be innocent doing them, but Jesus has called us to something more. But what is that more? What is that more? Indeed, as we look at this promise that Jesus promises transformation, it's that question that leads us to the second equally important point. And that is if we're going to be transformed into fishers of men, then we've got to be, be able to answer that question, what is next? What is new? What is the different thing that Jesus is calling us on to? And, and, and as we ask that question, we have to recognize that we have a lot to discover. That's the point. We have a lot to discover. The dictionary defines that term, discover, to mean to find out, to come to know, to learn. And for these disciples, this truth was self-evident. I mean, think about it. As we've already observed, fishermen were not known for their ability to teach or persuade I mean, yeah, they had gone off to school. They had learned to read, write, and probably do enough math to manage the books of their businesses, their, their fishing business. But maybe they'd even memorized a bunch of the Old Testament. In fact, that's probable. That's a lot of what they used to teach back in those days. They would memorize the Old Testament. But the truth is, these were fishermen. They were not scholars or academics. They were not professors or teachers in any way. Moreover, Jesus hadn't even begun to say or do anything. I mean, yeah, he had talked to them a couple of times, but he still hadn't given them anything significant so that they would know who he was or what he was about. They had no idea why they would need to fish for people. Bottom line is, these disciples were under no illusion at all. They had a lot to discover. The problem is we, on the other hand, sometimes forget this fact. I mean, especially if we've been to school, if we were raised in church, we have this tendency to assume that we know it all and there is nothing left for us to discover. We assume that we know God. We understand His character and His command, His will for our lives. And we've got everything more or less figured out. And in the process, we forget the words of Isaiah chapter 55 verse 9, where God warned, for as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Whenever I read that verse, it reminds me of the greatness of God, how big He is in comparison to me. But what's amazing to me is how well these words from Isaiah 55 have aged with time. In fact, if anything, they've gotten more powerful. Think about this for just a second. Do you realize that the farthest any human has ever ventured away from the planet Earth is the moon? 
The moon is 238,900 miles. That's 384,400 kilometers away from the earth. It takes light just over one second to travel from the moon to the earth. So when you look into the night sky, you see the moon, you're looking one second back in time. That's how long it took that light to get here. Voyager 1 is the farthest man-made object from earth. Some of you probably remember the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes that were launched in the 1970s. Here over the last couple of years, these have become the first man-made objects to leave our solar system. Voyager 1 is now 14.5 billion, with a B, miles. That's 23 billion kilometers away from the earth today. Light travels that far in less than 13 and a half hours. Compare that to this. Astronomers have observed a galaxy 13.1 billion light years away. So that we're all on the same page, a light year is how far light travels in a year. The farthest we have ever gone is a few light hours away. We're not even close. Indeed, the sum total of human knowledge is minuscule compared to the heights of heaven. How can we possibly have everything figured out? We have a lot to discover about God's character and commands, about ourselves, about this world that we're called to live in and minister to. We have a lot left to discover. And brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to realize that. Now the good news today is that as we look at this passage, we also begin to figure out how Jesus would help us discover these things. We learn this in the fact that he called his first disciples to follow him. And immediately they dropped what they were doing and they followed him. You know, one of the first rules of Bible study, and I've told you this before, and I'll keep telling you this again, one of the first rules of Bible study is that if it's repeated, it's important, right? You've heard this from me. You'll continue hearing it. What we discover here is that the word follow appears three times in these five verses. And that suggests to me that it might be kind of sort of, a little bit important. And indeed, we have a lot to discover, and we discover it by following. What I mean by that is this. If we follow the disciples from the Sea of Galilee, we begin to understand what Jesus was doing. By the end of Matthew chapter 4, Jesus began teaching, preaching, and healing every disease and sickness. The disciples fairly quickly realized as they saw this with their own eyes, as they heard with their own ears what he was saying, this is not your ordinary carpenter. In Matthew chapter 5, he began his longest, most famous discourse, the Sermon on the Mount. And in it they learned that the kingdom of God is always more than and often exactly the opposite of what they and we expect. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus touched a man with leprosy before he healed him. And they learned that God makes the unclean clean, the shameful more, the shameful right, the guilty innocent. God, Jesus transforms. By Matthew 16, the, these men had learned enough to realize that Jesus was the Son of God. And in Matthew 17... When he was transfigured before their very eyes, they learned that his kingdom was anything but of this world. Now what I really find fascinating here is the different ways in which Jesus taught and they discovered these things. Think about this for just a second. The Sermon on the Mount was essentially a sermon or a lecture. 
They all sat down around Jesus and they listened as he taught, just like we might expect in a modern classroom. The leprous man, on the other hand, was met and healed as they walked along the road. Here they are just walking down the road. The leprous guy comes out and says, hey, you can heal me. And Jesus touches him and said, I'm willing to heal you. You're healed. Peter first called Jesus the Son of God in Caesarea Philippi, the thoroughly worldly capital of the Roman province. This is not even a Jewish community. This is a thoroughly Gentile community. And we discover that Jesus doesn't have boundaries or borders. He goes beyond all of that. And when he was transfigured, it was on a mountaintop, which is seen by many as a holy place from the unholy Caesarea Philippi to the holy mountaintop. Jesus is in charge of it all. What we discover in these things and so many more instances and incidents in the Gospels is that Jesus wants to teach us a variety of things in a variety of places and ways. It's like He wants to be our guide on this epic adventure that is discipleship. And I think that's why I like this word discover more than I like the word learn. See, when I hear the word learn in my brain, it suggests stuffy, stale, classroom kind of stuff. But Jesus Following Jesus is anything but stuffy, stale, classroom sort of stuff. You understand? So what we discover here is that Jesus leads us to discover through following. And the way that we follow, since we don't have Jesus right here in front of us to follow in his literal footsteps, the way that we follow is through Scripture, corporate Scripture, reading and studying, things like sermons like here today, things like Bible studies, that kind of stuff, Sunday school groups, whatever. But also through personal Bible study. Last week I issued to you, a couple weeks ago, I issued to you the one-hour challenge, and the challenge was to replace one hour of other media with one hour of Bible study and prayer at home on your own. We need that. Because without it, what's forming us? What are we following in this world? We need to follow Jesus by studying Scripture. We also need to follow Jesus by spending time in prayer. Now again, prayer is one of those things that we often think that we understand because we all have our laundry list of prayer items that we need. And so we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, here's what I need from you. We check them off and then we're out the door. But I tell you today, the most important role of prayer is not to tell Jesus what we need. Because here's the, you want a shocker, a spoiler? This is it. Jesus is omniscient. He already knows what we need. We don't need to tell him again. It's far more important when we come to the Lord in prayer that we sit and we listen and we ask Him, Lord, what do you want from me? That's what I, talk, what, that's what I mean when I talk about prayer. We can follow Jesus through tradition. Look at history and see how He's worked and moved. Not just in the Gospels, but in the history of the church and the nation. We can follow Jesus by picking out a mentor, somebody who's further down the pathway of discipleship, the yellow brick road, so to speak, who knows the way, at least for the next few steps, that we can fall in behind and learn a little bit from them. We discover by following Jesus to observe what's going on in the world around us. One of my favorite obscure passages of the Bible 
is 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, where it speaks of the 200 chieftains of the tribe of Issachar. The Bible describes these 200 men as people who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. And it says that because they knew what Israel should do, they understood the times and knew what Israel should do, they chose to leave the camp of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, the first king of Israel, and go over to the upstart David and follow him instead. What does it mean that they understood the times? Except that they were just watching to see what the world was doing around them. Which of these two leaders was more godly? What was happening in the community around us as we followed this one or that one? I tell you today, Jesus Jesus leads us to discover simply by doing exactly that, leading. And we discover these things that he wants us to learn simply by falling in step behind him and following. We discover it all by following. This is what it looks like. This is what it means. And and if I was going to give you a challenge today, it would simply be that. Don't sit where you are. But get up and start following. Follow Jesus as he leads us down the yellow brick road. Follow Jesus as he leads us through this world. Follow Jesus as he leads us on an adventure of discovery. And yes, it is an adventure of discovery. Do you realize how many disciples go through life? Oh boy, this isn't any fun. But if we approach it as an adventure, we're going to discover new and important things on. Doesn't it become a little more energizing than that? We discover it all by following. In The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy was told You get to where you need to go by following the yellow brick road. And if that's all it was, if that was as simple as everything was, then that would have been the end of the story. She gets on the yellow brick road and she ends up at the Wizard of Oz and she goes home. The end, right? But it's all the stuff that she encounters along the yellow brick road. As she follows the yellow brick road, that was what got her home. And I tell you today, my friends, it's all the things that we will discover as we follow Jesus that will turn us into the disciples, the Christ-like followers that we're supposed to be. So will you go with me on this journey of discovery? Will you spend time studying all of these things? Following Jesus everywhere he leads. Will you go discovering with me today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you today grateful that it is not a stale, stuffy, classroom sort of life when we choose to follow you. But it is an adventure of discovery. And today, Lord, we ask that you would help us to set out on this adventure with the excitement and enthusiasm that it is due. That just like the disciples, we would drop everything that holds us back and we would follow you with everything we've got. That we would learn from you every step of the way by studying scripture and sitting down to listen in prayer, by 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 looking at tradition and history in the church and in the world and and finding mentors who can lead us along the way and, and just by observing what's happening around us and comparing that to who we what we know of you and your will. Lord, today 
we choose to follow you. And we trust that you will help us discover everything we need to be transformed from the fishers that we were into the fishers of men that you've called us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus promises to transform each of us. But in order for that to happen, we have to discover a lot of stuff. And the only way we're going to do that is by getting up and following him. Follow him on this adventure of discovery with me. Thanks for coming this morning. Be blessed. Be a blessing.